All right, so if you'll turn to Acts chapter 9 with me tonight. <clears throat> tonight is circumstances surrounding conversion. We have been talking about already, we've been talking about testimonies. All right, if you remember back, we talked about Simon the Sorcerer. Simon the Sorcerer did not have a real testimony. You know what he wanted? He wanted the, the, the power, but he didn't want the what? Anybody remember that? I'm going to make sure you all awake with me tonight, or I'm going to sit down until you answer the questions. <laughs> he didn't want the power. He wanted the what? He wanted the source of the power, right? All right, so that was one thing. That was a fake conversion, Simon the Sorcerer. Then you had Philip the, and the Ethiopian eunuch. What was uh, Philip doing? He was reading the scriptures, and he was reading out of Isaiah, right? So he was reading out of Isaiah, and what was the passage pointing to, or who was it pointing to? What was it talking about? Jesus, I think I heard somebody say. So all of a sudden, he was looking, he was searching already, and because he was searching, God sent somebody along the way to help him find a way, right? And then all of a sudden, you had Saul, which it later turned into Paul, and he ran into his Savior on the, on the road to Damascus. Jesus actually appeared to him. So what you see in every six uh, circumstance, you'll see that there are different ways that people come to the Lord. Different ways. And you know what? We expect everybody to have the same circumstances. We expect everybody to come to the Lord the way that we do sometimes. You know what? The, the fact of the matter is, is not everybody's going to come to know Christ. Matter of fact, probably if we work on it hard enough, the, the, the souls should be saved outside of church. We should be out there living a life well enough to where people look at us and they see Christ in us. And we can tell that testimony to people and we can share the gospel right there at work right there in a grocery store, wherever it may be, but we can, serve, we can share the gospel of Christ. So there's different circumstances that surround each and every one of these things that we're talking. Now, but through these passages in the book of Acts, we're going to see the circumstances of the conversions of these ones mentioned. So Acts chapter 9, and we're going to read verse 32. It says, Now it came to pass... As Peter went through all parts of the country, that he also come down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. There he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and paralyzed. And Peter said to Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. Then he rose immediately. So all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. At Joppa there was a certain disciple named Tabitha which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in her upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the window, widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and the widows, he presented her alive. And it became and it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. So it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with a Simon, a tanner. So what happened the first time here is many believed by seeing the evidence. So the first account of the evidence was that people in Lydda saw the miracle of the healing of a body. Now Lydda was a Gentile city that was about 25 miles from Jerusalem. It is important to notice who Peter was going to visit when he went to Lydda. The people that he was going to visit was the saints. The saints were the Christian believers, of course. But it was his only purpose on going there was to check out the church. Do you think uh, Peter's only purpose was to go to Lydda and just check out the church? Or do you think that he was willing to be used by God and God was willing to be used by Peter and Peter was willing to go wherever God called him to go? And that's where he went. He went to Lydda. So... While Peter was in Lydda, he met a paralyzed man named 
Aeneas. And I, boy, I want that. That's a hard name I keep putting in my mind, and it's hard. I want to pronounce it so many different ways. So if I mess it up sometime tonight, you know why. But Aeneas, um, he met this paralyzed man, and the writer Luke tells us very little about this man. Was he a Christian? We don't know. The, the scripture don't say whether he was a, uh, a Christian or not. But Sam say because Peter went to go visit the saints that he was a child of God. But then there were some say because um, it was in the New King James Version that there was a certain man. So a certain man, they were thinking that maybe it's, he wasn't a believer. But either way, it's beside the point um, right here. We can't be sure. But how old was he? You know, that's the thing about the scripture. You know, we got to look down deep, find out the background, find out how old he was. All these things. We don't know how old he was. We don't know whether he was a Jew or Gentile. But we do know that he was paralyzed for eight years. And he was crippled and he was helpless. And he was a burden to himself and to others. Now, Peter heals the man by the power of God. And it's interesting to note that the results of this miracle is the same as the results of the miracle of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. I want you to turn over real quick, or turn back actually, to John chapter 12 with me real quick. And I want you to look at verse 9. John chapter 12, verse 9. Everybody there? Still hear pages. John chapter 12, verse 9. It says in John chapter 12, verse 9, Now a great many of the Jews that knew that he was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake, but that they might also see Lazarus, who, had him, who he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away, and what did they do? Believed in Jesus. All right. And if you go back to Acts chapter nine, right, if you go back to Acts chapter nine and if we look down at verse thirty one or verse thirty one, it says, then the churches throughout Judea. I'm still wrong. Verse thirty two. Now it came to pass as he went through all the parts of the country that he came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. And verse thirty five. So all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and did what? Turn to the Lord, right? So here's what we see in both accounts. Others came to know Christ because of the miracle that they witnessed. Now, do how many people in here have seen miracles? You know, I, I've witnessed miracles. I've, I believe I've probably seen at least five that I could talk about tonight if I wanted to. I know for a fact they were miracles. I mean, from my son getting pulled out by a dog that nobody even saw. He fell into a fish pond and... And we'll come around the corner and the dog is wet from, you know, from his head down to his like front part of his body. And um, I think it was Aaron. He was soaking wet. But the dog was wet from there. When I come back out of the building and I look and he was there crying and I'm like, you knew that was <laughs> what happened. So so there's miracles that I've seen. I've seen healings. I've got two people in my family that have beat the odds. I've had a nephew that when he was five years old had cancer all over his body. He is now 16 years old. Um, doctors didn't never thought he's had a heart transplant and all this stuff and he's, he's living well today. Right? I had a nephew that slid and broke his ankle and slid, slid in the home, broke his ankle and um, he went to Haiti with us on crutches. Um, we prayed over him, the Haitians and, and Royce was there at that time. We were praying with him, praying over him and and um, the doctor said he would always walk with a limp and that he would need some help. And um, when he got back, the doctors, when they x-rayed it, he said, I've never seen anything like it before. And, you know, it was healed. Never, you know, we, we were in Haiti, saw a girl come to us. Remember that day? <laughs> Lady, a uh, little girl come to us. Uh, her ear was rotted half off. And um, she come to us one day and we prayed over her. And the next day, uh, I still have to ask them about this because it's still, I have to make sure it's real. <laughs> but uh, she come back the next day, her ear was completely restored. So <laughs> these are things that happen. I've seen them. I've seen them with my own eyes. Does it strengthen my faith? You better believe it. 
And Satan, he wants to throw that doubt in there. But people come to know Christ because of miracles like that. Do we need them in our country? You know what? There's not a need for miracles in our country because we've got uh, churches on every corner. <laughs> Go down our road right here in Highway 80 Bloomingdale, you'll see them. But um, I think we got half of the churches in the United States right here on Highway 80. So... <laughs> So we got all these things. We got radio. We got internet. We got all these things to where we can hear the gospel and see the gospel. You know, but people in places like Haiti, they don't have that. So when you see miracles take place, you know, God is still doing miracles today. He's still doing healings today. Do I believe in the healings on TV? Not so much. But do I believe that we can pray over people and that they can be healed? Absolutely. But we don't know. We don't know who's going to be saved, but we do pray for that miracle to happen, and we hope it happens. But does God want it to happen for no reason at all? He wants people to come to know Christ because of it. He wants people to say, wow, is that what you've done? <laughs> you know, and then come to believe. And that's what happened here. When they saw the miracles, they come to believe because of those miracles, right? So the second account was the people in Joppa. Um, they witnessed the raising of the dead. <laughs> Anybody in here witnessed the raising of the dead before? <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to witness the raising of the dead because if there's a dead person and they rise up when I'm around and I'm by myself, <laughs> that ain't going to be fun. I'm going to make a hole through the wall or through the window or something. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't handle that. <laughs> and, I'm, and I hope God knows that I can't handle that. But... But, you know, the raising of the dead. Uh, but Joppa, when you think about this place, it's mentioned a few times in the Bible. Um, it's 38 miles from Jerusalem. It's today known as Jaffa with two F's instead of J-A-F-F-A -F -F instead of J-O-P-P-A. And it's a suburb of Tel Aviv. So Jaffa was the town in which the cedars of Lebanon had been floated to be shipped to Jerusalem and used in the temple construction. The prophet Jonah went to Jaffa. You remember that? The the prophet Jonah went to Joppa to find a ship sailing to Tarshish to run from the call that God was placing on his life. So Jonah went to Joppa to avoid going to the Gentiles, but Peter in Joppa received his call to go to the Gentiles. You see the two difference in their faith at the time, right? Now, so there was a woman in Joppa. Her name was Dorcas. Anybody want to name their daughter Dorcas? <laughs> What kind of name, what kind of joking you think is going to happen with that one? I think they're going to cut it short and call him Dork, Dorcas, but that's the name of it. Her name was Dorcas, and it's translated from Tabitha, which means gazelle. But she was making a huge impact by making good and helping, by doing good and helping the poor. She made robes and other clothing, right? But she got sick and she died. But since Peter was in Lydda at the time, and this was not far from Joppa, they called for Peter to come. And there's no other record in the book of Acts that any of the other prophets have raised anybody else from the dead. Right? There's no other place that says that. So the faith came not in Peter, and that's another thing, but it came in the power of the resurrected Christ. But after all, Jesus raised the dead while he was on this earth, so why couldn't he raise the dead from his throne in heaven? So it wasn't anything that the apostles done. And I think it's shown in scripture over and over again that they, they give glory to God. But it was Jewish custom to wash the dead body. They were washing the dead body and anointed with spices. But when Peter arrived in the upper room, this is what was going on. A group of weeping widows was surrounded him, showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas made for them. What were they doing? Kind of basically what we do in a uh, viewing today. You know, we'll talk about, we'll have pictures up of the great things. If you have a man that loved to play golf, they'll put golf pictures up. If you have a man that liked fish or any of these. Well, Dorcas, she was, she was good at making clothes and robes for these poor people. And all of a sudden, when she died... Of course, it was going to make an impact on people, right? Think about it. Think about what she was doing in her life. And I want to just pause right there for a minute because I want you to understand that when you die, all right, people say I kill people off at work all the time. I say when you die or that person when he dies, uh, it was just a joke at work. I don't know why, but I don't kill people off. But here's the thing. When you die, though, I guess I am killing you off. But when you die, what is your testimony going to be, you know? Would you be known as that person that done all these things to help out? 
You know, it would be simple to know that just a simple cause as people come into from a drug and alcohol rehab program come into here on a Friday night for game night. Uh, has anybody ever thought about how we act toward those guys sometimes when we go to feed them at the park? Uh, a lot of times we're very good, we're very cordial, we're very friendly. But sometimes it's hard to go up to those, uh, just a guy that we don't know, and, and just go to have a conversation with them, right? But you know what? Let me tell you something. The ones of you that have actually sat down and had conversations with, guess what I heard at work the next day? I didn't hear about so much about that they love the cooking, don't get me wrong. They love everything, that they appreciate the church coming out, but what do they to remember more than anything. They remember that one person talking to them and spending time with them, right? So when it comes to game night, this is why I'm encouraging you again. Not only, you know, you make game night what you want out of it, but it has been slacking off. We've been dropping a little bit of number, but this is a thing to, where you can get in and you can make a difference in somebody's life. How many times do you get to make a difference in somebody's life like that? And you know what? I guarantee you'll find some of them guys that they just want to talk. Matter of fact, some of them will want to talk and talk and talk. And if you meet Mr. Rooks, he'll talk your ears off, okay? <laughs> That's my buddy, but he'll talk your ears off, all right? But if you take that time and you was to actually spend time doing trips to Haiti or something like that, and, and people, when you die, what are they going to say about you? Here's what I don't want. I don't want up here... If this is where I was going to be buried or my service to be held, I don't want up here a bunch of golf courses or anything like that. I don't want pictures of golf. You know what I want? I want pictures of maybe the trips that I went on as mission trips and stuff like that. I, you know, I'm in the midst of working on pictures of collage in my office of mission trips because you know why? That's my most prized possessions. That is my most prized possessions of any trips that I've ever been on in the world is the mission trips. And I love those kind of things. But if we can be known for that, if we can be known as Dorcas did for making these clothes for the poor, that is unbelievable that she done this kind of thing, right? But let's carry on in the story. Um, but after, uh, let's get back, uh, but Dorcas made the clothes, but, but Peter raised Dorcas from the dead. Now, let's turn over to Mark chapter 5, and I'm going to show you another story. That kind of relates to this too. Mark chapter 5, verse 34. Actually, go on to verse 35. It says, While he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house and said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any farther? As soon, and this is Jairus' daughter, he was a, um, a leader there, and um, um, as soon as Jesus heard the word that he had spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, but when he had put them all outside, and that's the second time we see in this instant here that he put them outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was laying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kuma, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was twelve years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it and said that some Something should be given to her to eat. So, here's the difference. Here's the same similarities here. The words spoken were almost identical. Talitha kuma, which means little girl arise. And then in the passage here, Tabitha kuma, which means Tabitha or Tabitha arise. In both instances, it was the power of God that raised the person from the dead. But the dead person could not exercise faith to make it happen. And Jesus took hold of the little girl before he spoke to her, sure, and he was not afraid of becoming ceremonial unclean. That was uncommon for a Jew to do that, was to touch a dead body. But Jesus was more concerned about the girl than he was about being ceremonial clean, right? And then that's the same thing that Peter did. He was willing to take the hand of Dorcas after he raised her from the dead. 
Now we see the second instance of a miracle and people coming to know Christ because of it. Now what is more important? The raising of the dead? Was that the most important thing here? Was this raising the woman from the dead? Or the raising of this woman because she helped so many other people? Or the others who saw it who came to Christ? So here's the thing. In this instance here, we saw that Dorcas, all of a sudden, done all these good things. I guarantee you her life made an impact on all these people, right? I guarantee you her life made more of an impact than the raising of the dead of that girl. I mean, because she lived her faith out. She was willing to help people out. She was willing to do all these things. But in both of these instances that we talked about today, we see that people believe because of the evidence that was seen. Now... Where again, we talked about miracles, we talked about people going to this and that, we talked about why do people come to God? Why do people have to see what's going to be done? Do you think that God, do you think people's going to come to God by what? Let's talk for instance for a minute. Will people come to God for no reason whatsoever? What do they have to see? They have to see faith in who? All of us, right? And what else do they have to see? Just because they see that faith in you, is that going to be enough for some people? Even faith is not enough for some people, right? What else could it be to bring people to Christ? What is it going to take for this church to build up and bring people to Christ? What did you say? Action. So faith, action, right? You got to put feet to the, the faith, right? you got to go out there, even though you've got the faith, you got to put feet to it. you got to go out there and do it. So anytime that we sit in church and we say that we have this faith, we talk about our faith, but we do nothing about it, as the Scripture says, we're nothing, right? We're nothing. And if we go out, but we put feet to the faith, and we go do something for somebody. And this is what we need to do. We need to always constantly be thinking about what we can do for other people. As a church, as individuals, What can we do? What can we do? You know what? You know what's more important? By finding something to do for somebody else is more important than any event that we could have at this church. More important than game night, more important than trunk or treat tomorrow, more important than anything is thinking how we can serve other people. And if we get to that point in our lives, we're going to grow as a church even more, right? So think about it. Think about where we're at tonight. I want you to just... Bow your heads real quick, and I want you to close your eyes. This won't be long, but I just want to tell you this. I want you to think to yourself right now, what are you doing in your life that's making an impact? What are you doing in your life that's making an impact? If you're not doing anything, and you're just saying, you know what, I'm just here. I'm existing. Or I'm just here, I'm just going to work every day. What is it that you're making an impact on tonight? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for what you have done. And there are so many things, Lord, that we can think of, that we can do in our lives to glorify you. But a lot of times we just don't put any feet to the faith that we talked about. I just pray, dear God, that you would just help us through these stories, Lord, that you work some miracles out. And even in our own lives, Lord, you've been working miracles. There's not a person in here probably that has not witnessed a miracle. Sometimes we'll count these miracles to doctors or medicine, but none of these people could have been healed without your power. So I just pray to God that you would just help us tonight, help us to look down deep and find out what we got going on in our lives. Help us to understand, help us to um, take hold of the commands that you've given us. Forgive us for the times that we have failed you. And forgive us for the times that we haven't done what you have called us to do. And I just pray right here tonight that there will be people that are willing to make a commitment for you tonight. Lord, the altar is always open. And there's something about kneeling before an altar. I just pray to God that you would just help people to come tonight. Got many things that we need to pray about. Many things that are on the hearts and minds of people here tonight. And I just pray instead of just sitting there, I pray that people will have that nerve, uh, will come up here and, again, kneel down at this altar and lay it at your feet. There's no need in carrying it any longer, Lord. No need in carrying that burden any longer. And we will thank you, and we will be so careful.
to give you all the honor and the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.